chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm just going to read you verse 8. Kind of give you a little Bible lesson today in the Sunday school hour. He said, but, but ye would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes this. He says, We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. We've all seen storms in our life. We've all witnessed it. Paul is referring to some of those in, in, that he had had in his life here. We all sat speechless watching the surreal scenes of the damage caused by storms. Uh, out on the East Coast, we have uh, hurricanes that come in and just devastate. In Oklahoma, we have tornadoes that come in and just wipe out a, an entire neighborhood and, and schools and churches just are, are flattened out. It's devastating. But Christians are not immune to things like that. We're not immune. Sometimes we think we are, but we're not. When these things happen, will it be storms, fires, earthquakes out here? Uh, as a nation, we've been given another chance to turn to Christ. I believe every one of these disasters is an opportunity for us to turn back to Christ. But Amen. We feel helpless, but there is something we can do. We can, we can pray to our God. But I'm going to talk to you this morning about seven ways that God uses a surge of problems in our lives. Because I know that everybody in this building right now has had problems. Amen. You've had difficulties. You've had family difficulties. You've had disappointments in your own family. You've had, you've had problems on the job. And by the way, if you've been going to church very long, you've seen problems in the church. Amen. Uh, I had a guy just not long ago say, me and my wife have been married for 43 years, and we've never had an argument. I said, you're a liar. So I don't, believe, I don't believe now, I don't believe anything you'll ever say to me again. Because don't tell me you've lived with somebody 43 years and never disagreed. You have disagreed. And in fact, in fact I'll, say, I'll say this, you more than just disagreed a little in 43 years. Okay, okay. Everybody agree with me and I won't call you a liar. Okay. Now, one old preacher said that we ought to be good to everybody because everybody's having a hard time. God is no respecter of persons. God has no pets. In spite of you saying, wait a minute, I thought I was God's pet. Well, it's okay that you believe that and understand in the context that you're saying it because he's been good to all of us. Amen. But the truth of the matter is he's no respecter of persons. Amen. He loves everybody the same. I mean, it's really hard to believe that when I look at me and, and then I look at Mike, how, I mean, how could God possibly love Mike as much as he loves me? I mean, Amen. I mean, I, I, but, but he does. But he does. And somebody may not be the same uh, eth ethnic group that I'm in. I'm, I'm an American Indian. You're living on my land right here. I mean, <laughs> right here. This, this is my land that you people came in and took my land over. The whites, the Mexicans, y'all took our land over. But understand, we're all the same in God's eyes. Amen. We're all the same. By the way, just kidding. Y'all look mean when I said that. Um, <laughs> But this is simply not the case. God loves everybody the same. Our hearts go out to those who are in deep right now and, and that they're having difficulties. And, and by the way, do you realize that right now in Europe, we have the largest NATO deployment since the Cold War? And we just go about our lives. I mean, Google that and see if I'm not right. Largest NATO force since the Cold War is deployed right now. Right now. And yet we just get up and live our lives and, and pretend that nothing's wrong. There's people in Europe right now 
that are having a hard time. Let, let me hurry up with this. If I don't get done with this, I may complete it maybe at a later time. But number one, how does God use a surge of problems to help us? How does God, number one, he uses a surge of problems to direct us. Sometimes God has got a lot of fire under you to get you moving. Yeah. Is that the way any of you are? Sometimes you've got to have a fire laid under you to get you in problems, often point us in a new direction and motivate us to change. And is God trying to get our attention? Maybe why you're having the problems you're having. And listen to me. The problems you're having, God may be trying to say, hey, hey, hey. Hey, wake up. You, you, you need to start going a different direction. Hey, hey, hey. God's wanting to direct you in your life. And God uses these problems to direct us. Proverbs 20, verse 30 says, The blueness of a wound cleanses away evil, so the stripes the inward parts of the belly. Now, this is not a popular scripture today because the government would, would say, well, uh, the, that you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't uh, spank a child, for example. Well, I believe one of the biggest problems we have in America is, is children are, are, are not disciplined. Amen. I got one, Mike believes that, but he's, he's, he's a redneck. Uh, Amen. The blueness of a wound cleanses away evil. There's sometimes that a surge of problems has to come in our life, and that surge is used, and God uses it to, to, to cleanse us of the evil in our life. God is trying to direct us to a, to a better path. The, the world deceives us, but after a serious bout with trouble, we usually don't care as much about what people think. Say amen right there. Amen. When we're having a surge of problems in our life, we don't worry too much about what other people think. See, that, my, 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 my daughter, my granddaughter, my great-granddaughter has got 108 fever. I'm really not concerned about the petty stuff that I was concerned about the day before. Right. God uses a surge of problems to direct us. Maybe he's doing that to you right now. Pride is plowed under. The world loses its value. The appetite for sin loses its taste. Oh, shout right there. When you're going through, maybe we need a surge of problem because we're, 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 we're getting too attached to sin. Right. But understand this. When, 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 I'm a, when one of my daughters is at death's door, which by the way, I've had that happen, and I've lost two children. So I know what it is to have problems. I know what it is to have pain. And most of my life, I, I've had difficulties like this. But I promise you, when my child is laying there suffering and with 108 degree fever and the doctor says there's nothing you can do, I'm not thinking about a woman. I'm not thinking about lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I'm thinking about I need God to help me. I want to live for God. I want to be close to God. Is that honest enough? Amen. Sometimes God uses problems right. to direct us. To get us on the right path once again. So if you're going through difficulty right now, whatever it is in your life, understand, God is trying to say, hey, 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 it's time to go this direction, not this direction. Amen. So he uses this. I mean, God could have kept Daniel out of the lion's den. God could have just, boom, God could have done that, but he didn't. He could have kept Paul and Silas out of jail. He could have kept the Hebrew children from the fiery furnace but it was good for all these to go through these experiences. And it's also been good for us to read about them going through those experiences. To see that there's a God in heaven and that God wants to see us through our problems. Amen. Through our difficulties. Not out of, but through. Number two, God uses a surge of problems to not only to direct us, but to inspect us. People are like tea bags. If you want to know what's inside them, just drop them in hot water. Amen. We get dropped in hot water, we show what we really are. Has God ever tested your faith with a problem? The answer to that is yes. Amen. And then what do problems reveal about you? See, the, the, the trial and the problem we go through, what it does, it only reveals our character. You may have heard me say this before, but I, I, I could have a tube of toothpaste up here. 
and I could try to, and I could squeeze. I may want money to come out. I might want gold to come out. But, but you know what's going to come out if I squeeze the tube of toothpaste? You know what's going to come out? Any brilliant scientists want to tell me what's going to come out? Toothpaste. Anybody want to know why? Because that's what's inside. Amen. When you get squeezed, by the cares of this world. When you get squeezed by problems and difficulties and your persecutions maybe even, when you get squeezed, what's going to come out of you is what's already in you. That's right. And we need to make sure that we have the right stuff inside. That's right. So you're going through a problem, God uses problems to inspect us. James 1 says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into, into divers' temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And we all need that. Amen. Well, he uses the search of problems to direct us. How are you doing so far? Mm -hmm. He uses the search of problems to inspect us. What's inside? Mm -hmm. Number three. He uses the search of problems to correct us. Correct us. Some lessons we learn only through pain and failure. Let's go ahead and admit that. Amen. Sometimes uh, we're not honest with ourselves. That's right. But have you that raised children, did you realize that, that sometimes the only way that, that the only way when you've got a, a strong willed child, the, the only way you're going to keep them from pulling this flower off of, off of the table is to say, no, no. Amen. Because some of you modern day parents, uh, it's obvious you don't do that. But yet the Word of God tells us we need to do that. I mean, you understand? I don't care what the government says, what the state says. The, the blue spoon flits wave and understand there's time. The Bible says if you love your child, you correct your child. Amen. In fact, Proverbs says you'll do it B times. That means when they need it. Right. You'll need that. But we, we don't, but see, God uses a surge of protection. God uses a surge of problems to... That's no, right. God uses a surge of problems to... To, to spank us, if you please, to, to chasten us, to correct us. It's like as a child, your parents told you to not touch a hot stove. I hope they did. But you probably learned not to touch a hot stove by getting burned. Amen. Sometimes we only learn the value of something by losing it. Psalm 119 said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted. Whoa, wow, whoa, whoa, whoa. Here's a man after God's own heart. He says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Mm -hmm. Somebody in this room tonight, today, <laughs> needs to listen to this old preacher. Amen. Amen. That problem you're going through right now, it's good for you. That's right. There's an old song that, that, that uh, uh, the old timers used to sing when I was growing up. It said, he washed my eyes with tears that I might see. The broken heart I had was good for me. He tore it all apart and looked inside. He found it full of fear and foolish pride. He swept away the things. And it, it, but the whole point is that sometimes pain, problems, yes, tears, God comes and, and, and directs us. God comes and tries to, to inspect us. But also God has to correct us through a surge of problems. It's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn, that, that I may be more like Jesus, that I might know the Word of God better, that I might be closer to Him, that I might be a better Christian. And sometimes the only way that happens is if we go through trouble. Amen. Amen. God uses these things to correct us. That's right. Maybe that's what God is doing right now to you. Could that be possible? Amen. Maybe what you're going through right now, God is saying, and then if that don't work, then all of a sudden one day God says, okay, buddy. So he started, my, my dad was a very gifted man. He was a construction worker and a farmer, big guy. My dad could, could do this with his belt. One hand could undo his belt, and then he would pull that belt up with one with one swath. I mean, he he was good at it. And he'd pull that belt off, and buddy, he'd grab me by the arm, and here he'd go to whooping me with that belt. 
Well, some of you right now, God, right? I'm talking to somebody right now. Can y'all hear me back there in the back? Okay, good. I told them this is not a Fruit of Baptist Church. Or this is. That's how I know it's Fruit of Baptist Church. I didn't see the sign, but when I walked into this Fruit of Baptist Church, because they all sat in the back. Uh, but God may have been, listen, listen, God may be, but God may be getting ready to take his belt off. Amen. Look at me. God may be getting ready to take his belt off. God uses problems, pain, difficulty. God uses these things to correct us. Amen. Okay, let's hurry. Number four, God uses the surge of problems to connect us. When someone dies in the family, loved ones gather from far and near for the funeral, right? They come from here, yonder, and there. People want to be together when in trouble. When someone is seriously ill, their friends and neighbors gather in to check on them and make sure they're all right. Bring them, you know, a meatloaf. Bring them, you know, a banana pudding. Bring them something, you know, to uh, comfort food. That's why it's called that, by the way. Bring them comfort food because they're going through pain. They're going through problems. They're going through difficulty. So they bring them an offering to help them get through this. But, but God uses a surge of problems to connect us. See, trouble not only draws people together, but it also draws them to Jesus. David said, once again, it's amazing to me. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. I'm, I'm, Brother Pat, I'm getting doodads reading that one. Holy Ghost just come, come, Holy Ghost just come on the scene right now. David said, before my son rebelled against me, I went astray. Mm -hmm. He said, but yet this family trouble caused me to turn back to God. Amen. Before I was afflicted, but before Saul tried to you know, put a, a death warrant out on me, he said, he said I, I went astray. But he said, once that occurred, he said, I, I came back to God and began to depend on God and say, God, forgive me. God, I need you. God, God, I, I, I desire you in my life. I want everybody needs to understand what the, this psalm. He said, he said, before I was afflicted, before, the, the, that's in Psalm 119.67. You need to mark that. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Many a person has called for a preacher in times of trouble to make things right with God. Usually it doesn't happen right after they get a big check, even though it should. Amen. People usually don't call me right after they got a $50,000 raise at the job. You know when they call me? When the kids got 108 fever. When they just lost their job. Okay, I, I had a, I, I've got a family member that, it's a son-in-law. He hardly ever calls me. Hardly ever. Love him. He loves me. I love him. Yesterday, he called me. I said, what in the world? He called me and said, I've lost my job. He finished this job, a high-paying job for a long time. He called me and want me to pray. And, 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 and you know, be, but, but what, that's what I'm trying to say. That he called me because now he's hurting. He called me because now he, he's got a problem. Well, understand, there's a lot of people that will never call on God until they get in trouble. Right. When then trouble also draws people to church. It's not uncommon to see a whole family show up to church after a funeral. Right? right? I mean, is that, have you seen that happen in, in your church? Sometimes when people get bad news from the doctor about their physical condition, they take a renewed interest in church and the things of God. So trouble unifies. So God uses a surge of problems to connect us. Amen. Okay. Some of you right now may be in this church because of some trouble that happened in your life. Amen. I guarantee you, I got saved. I, 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 you know why I got saved? Because I was in trouble. I got saved and you say, Brother Linton, that, that's not good. Well, I, I know it don't sound good, but if, if my wife hadn't have left, I may have never come to Christ. 
If I hadn't have got thrown in jail, I may have never come to Christ. You understand? You say, preach up not to talk like that. I'm just telling you, if I hadn't had that bad car wreck that killed my best friend, and you know, and I, and I'm up there with his blood and in, intestines coming down in my face. If, if that had not happened, I may not have ever turned to Christ. Amen. God uses a surge of problems. I remember looking up in the sky the night I got saved. And, and, and this is what I said. to I, I didn't even know if I believed in a God. In fact, I said I did not believe in God. I claimed to be an atheist. And I looked up in the sky with all these things happening. A, you know, a car wreck, a, being in a tornado, losing a bunch of money, being busted for drugs and for driving drunk and uh, disorderly conduct. And I mean, the, the list goes on. And, 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 and then now my wife's leaving and, and, and saying, I can't live like that. I can't live with a drunk. But as I see her walking down the road, I remember this. I remember looking up in the sky and I actually said this. I said, God, if you're up there, why is all this stuff happening to me? But the Holy Spirit of God said, right then, right then, he says, you know why. You know why. You know what I did? I got down in that ditch. I got forgiveness of my sin. And I got connected. I got connected Amen. to God. My wife led me to Christ in that ditch. I got connected. But it was because of a surge of problems. If you're here today and you're not saved, these things going on in your life right now, I want you to understand, all of these things are working out to get you to... And it's everything... Everything is to get us to Jesus. Amen. Everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything is to get us to Jesus because that is the most... Listen, you've got 70 years down here and, and some of you living on borrowed time. I see that. That, that God says you've you got 70 years and, and by reason of you know uh, faith or good health, you, you might live a little bit longer. But understand, in that 70 years, you're not down here in that 70 years to, to make money. You're not down here to buy the stuff and big houses and land. You're not down here to be an entrepreneur. You're not, you're not even here just to be a good family man. The primary reason that you live on planet Earth is for you to be right with God. Amen. And if you got your mind on anything else, you got your mind wrong. Get to Jesus. Get to Jesus. Oh, I gotta hurry. Number number five. God uses a surge of problems troubles in our life to protect us. To protect us. See, a problem can be a, can be a blessing in disguise. If that problem prevents you from being harmed by something more serious. See, I read about a guy who was fired for refusing to do something unethical that his boss had asked him to do. His unemployment was a problem. But it saved him from being convicted and sent to prison a year later when the management's actions were eventually discovered. I had a deal happen to me one time. I may have told you about this. Don't think so. We had uh, 183 HUD homes in Tulsa. We, uh, the, they approached us. The city of Tulsa approached us and said, listen, all these abandoned HUD homes are being vandalized and it makes sense that that they, they won't be vandalized as much if somebody's in them. Y'all, that's true, right? Amen. Made sense to them, made sense to me. So I said, okay. So we took the keys to 183 homes. So we started putting the homeless people that were in Tulsa. We we started placing them in the home. We'd do some minor repairs to them and and, and all that. But very good program. We don't call homes for the needy. Well, one day these investors, free will Baptist guys. Flew to Tulsa, a lawyer, a good friend of mine, and, and, uh, and another wealthy guy, two millionaires and a lawyer. They flew to Tulsa and they was inquiring about this, this HUD thing I had. There was an independent Baptist guy in Oklahoma City had the same program. We had Tulsa, Oklahoma City between two churches. Well, they, they came and, and, and they uh, said, listen, you have the inside paperwork about how much the government has to have for these houses. Yeah, I get that every month. 
it's, a, it, it, it's something that wasn't known to the public. It was something that, that just me and the guy from Oklahoma City knew about and, 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 and of course, had. It. Well, they said, well, why don't you sell us these homes for this price? The one guy would buy it off of, uh, of HUD. The next guy would buy it off him. And then they'd put it on the market and, and everybody make a bunch of money. And they said, what we'll do, I'll make a third, I'll make a third, and we'll give you a third of all these houses. Well, the lawyer's sitting there. The lawyer says, it's all legal. I, I've researched it and, and I've, done, I've done all the, the, the paperwork and everything's legal. It's just a good thing for HUD gets to get rid of the homes and, and, and what they want to do and, 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 and we all make money. Sounded great. A lawyer, I mean, by the way, a Christian lawyer. Sounds good, man. So I looked at the paperwork. Everything's in order. Here's what we do. We're going to make a bunch of money, and we're going to help people. See, it makes us feel better when we say stuff like that. We're going to help people. I, I talked to this old preacher, old, old guy. The Bible says that these gray hairs are supposed to mean something. So I went to this old guy, and I says, uh, Brother Woods, I said, uh, and I explained the whole deal to him. He looked at me and he says, uh, it sounds crooked to me. He said, I think you ought to stay away from it. I said, but they, he knew all three of the men. He, he said, I know them. He said, I believe they're good men. He said, I believe they think this is good. He said, if I'm telling you, son, it's crooked, you need to stay away from it. Oh, man. You know what I did? I listened to this old man. Okay. Went on for three or four months. Nothing. Okay. I turned the guys down. They got mad at me. They wasted plane fare to Oklahoma. I mean, they were they were really, really upset with me. Well, I was in Virginia Beach preaching a revival for Dale Burton. One, one of the largest churches in, in the country. And, and was there preaching. And it was on a Tuesday that these that these guys in a, in a black SUV pull up right up there to the church. They had called Tulsa and my dumb secretary told them where I was at. Is Curtis Linton here? They said, no, he's a Virginia Beach, Virginia priest at Gateway Church for Dale Burton. I mean, blah, 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 just spilled her guts. To, so, so here, these Fed guys, that they, they show up at, my, at, the, at the church office at Virginia Beach. I'm in there with the pastor. They come in demanding to see Curtis Linton. They pull me in a room by themselves. They interrogate me over this HUD deal. They, they interrogate, and, and we're in there for two hours. How many of y'all know that that was uncomfortable? They interrogate me. And the only thing they found that they didn't like was I had put a staff member that was over this program. I had put him in one of those homes and they said, you can't, you can't do that. You'll need to find a place for him to move. But they gave me six months to do that. But the one guy turned to the other, he, and I quote, he said, this guy is clean as a hound's tooth. That was good words right there. Amen. This guy's clean as a hound's tooth. Well, my friend, my independent Baptist buddy that pastored a large church in Oklahoma City, he had done the program. He, he had got in and sold the problems and made a bunch of money. Well, guess what? My friend went to prison. Independent Baptist pastor, large church, went to the federal penitentiary. I, I bought his truck. He said, I can't make payments. I'm in the pen. I took over his truck. And, and, and uh, that's what I got out of the deal. I got me a good truck for cheap. <laughs> I did what was right. He did what was wrong. Amen. But sometimes God uses problems in a surge of trouble. Uh, not, not only to inspect us, to direct us. To, but sometimes he uses these things to protect us. That's right. You may not have got that deal because God's trying to protect you. I'm glad that old timer broke my heart. I'm glad he dashed my hopes for a bunch of money. I'm glad that he told me don't do that. I'm glad he says it sounds crooked. And I lost a bunch of money. But understand, I didn't have to go to the federal penitentiary. Amen. God uses things to protect us. Hallelujah. Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis 50, he said, as for you, ye thought evil against me, 
But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, it is this day, to save much people alive. He went through getting a, a you know, the brothers were mean to him. They, they put him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. He, he was a slave. He was in Potiphar's house. He, he got accused of rape, which he did not commit. He had to go to prison for crying out loud. But all these things were used so that God could do a great work for the people of God. God used the surge of problems to protect the people of God. Amen. So he's using a surge of problems. You got problems? Anybody here got problems? I'm trying to help you this morning. Number six. God uses a surge of problems to perfect us. To perfect us. Problems, when they're responded to correctly, are character builders. God is one. This is the best statement I'm going to make today, so listen to me. God is more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. Amen. He's more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. See, your relationship to God and your character are the only two things you're going to be able to take with you to heaven. Romans 5 and verse 3 says, not, not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. God uses a surge of problems to perfect us. David said in Psalm 71, 19, he said, O God, who is like unto thee? Thou which showed me great and sore trouble shall quicken me. It means make alive. He said, God, he said, Thou which showed me great and sore troubles. Troubles, problems, difficulties. Thou shalt quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. My, 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 what a song. Here we find the effect of trouble. It was a blessing in disguise, a benefit to, to, to his life and, and to this good servant of the Lord. Paul emphasized, he said in Romans 8, 28, he says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. God uses problems to perfect us, to sanctify us, to make him more to make us more like him. Amen. The little kids used to sing a song. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How wonderful and patient he must be. He's still working on me. Amen. And by the way, aren't you glad he's still working on us? Amen. And God uses problems to perfect us, to make us more like Jesus. The graduate degree of spirituality comes from attending the University of Hard Knocks. Anybody enrolled in the School of Hard Knocks? <laughs> Been there, done that. And then last of all, when I'm done, God uses a surge of problems to project us. Project. That's what Salinas Church needs. You need to be projected. You need to be projected out into a lost and dying world. You need to project to be projected in your faith. You need to grow in God's grace. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. The surge of problems focuses on us inwardly, on what is most important. It furthers God's cause. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. He said, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. All the bad things that happened to him, he said, they tried to kill me at Lystra. They stole me, tried to kill me with rock. He said, I was let down in a basket. He said, I was beaten with, with 39 stripes on three different occasions. I've been in a shipwreck. I've been in peril, been in peril, 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 peril. Paul lists all this stuff he's gone through. Got stripes beyond, you can't even count how many stripes he's had on his back. Been in prison, been in stocks, been in bonds. And Paul said, everything that happened to me, happened to me and has made me 
further the gospel. In fact, he ended up in a jail cell, but you know what? It was in that jail cell that he wrote most of the epistles. Sitting in a jail cell, chained to a guard. God used a surge of problems to project him. Projected him all the way to Rome. Amen. Where he could preach and also where he could write the word of God. The Weather Bureau in the Caribbean uses planes to help keep check on the weather. These planes have learned how to take advantage of the cyclone winds in that area. Listen to me. When going north, they get on the fringe of the cyclone winds and take advantage of the tremendous uh, uh, tailwinds, they call it. And they get out there. They actually ride the fringe of the storm to save time and fuel. Then coming back south, they get on the other edge and take advantage of the same storm to go in the opposite direction. Cyclone's going this way. So when they're going this way, they get in the tailwind, let it pull them this way. When they're coming back, they get in the tailwind to take them back the other direction. Okay, preacher, that, that's good. So you know about the weather. Listen, did you know that an eagle knows when a storm is getting ready to hit before it even gets there? God put something inside an eagle. The eagle will fly to some high spot and wait for the winds to come. When the storm hits, it sets its wings so that the wind will pick it up and lift it above the storm. And while the storm rages below, the eagle is soaring above it. Friend, that's what God wants for you this morning. Amen. God wants for you to be projected. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The eagle doesn't escape the storm. It simply uses that storm to lift it higher, higher, higher. It rises on the winds that bring the storm. When the storms of life come in our lives so we can rise above them by setting our minds toward God. The storms don't have to overcome us. We can allow God's power to lift us above them. It's not the burdens of life that weigh us down. It's how we handle the burdens Amen. of life. Right. Isaiah 40 and verse 30 says, They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Now hear me very closely, children. God is at work in your life. I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. He's at work in your life. Even mm -hmm. when you don't recognize it, don't understand it, then may not even admit it. He's in the storm with you. You're going through problems, you're going through a storm, he's in the storm with you. He's calling you to rise above it, to be a water walker, not a boat person. Mm -hmm. We got too many boat people in Christian churches. We got too many boat people that are content to stay in the boat, and we don't have a lot of water walkers. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes on him during the storm so it doesn't get you down like Peter got down. We read in James 1.12, Blessed is that man that endureth temptation, endureth trouble. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Someone said, for God has marked every sorrowing day and numbered every secret tear. And heaven's long age of bliss shall pay for all his children suffer here. Those who go through fire or water should remember it's God's way of refining and cleansing you for his good, your good, and his glory. Amen. Amen. All things work together for good for those that love God and are called to his purpose. Trouble is simply the factory God is using to manufacture the right type of product in you. I had a long poem I'm going to read. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to save you time. When Adam and Eve were in trouble, God stepped in and met their need, right? Mm -hmm. They sinned and were in trouble. Mm -hmm. Noah's problems were solved when God who cared about him and his family and said, build an ark. Joseph was released from prison and became second in command in Egypt and saved the whole nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. The children of Israel were delivered as they crossed the Red Sea. Elijah got God's help in getting some rain. 
Paul and Silas were set free from the Philippian jail. Mm -hmm. And God's saving hand is in motion in your storm right now. Yeah. Longing to touch you and heal your broken life and to heal your broken heart. Both believers and those that need to believe through this. There was a old man down in West Virginia, Pringle Baptist guy. He'd come to the altar all the time. Heard Jack Laster talk about this, and, and Jack was actually, I've actually been in the church myself. No good guy, dressed in overalls, you know, just a very poor man, but he, he'll come to the altar. And the, the first time it happened, it was really life-changing for me, but he's, he's a little bit slow. But he, he, he come to the altar and say, Oh, God, I hate flour. You ever had a mouthful of flour by itself? Mm -hmm. It's not great. Mm -hmm. It's not really good. It's dry. Then he'd say, Oh, God, I hate lard. <laughs> you ever took a bite of lard? Just hog lard? You ever took a bite? Not very good. He said, God, I hate salt. Anybody here eat salt by itself? <laughs> it figures. <laughs> oh God, I hate raw eggs. And God, I sure do hate buttermilk. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. But then down at the altar, he's doing it. People thought he was crazy, and they still do, I guess. But then he gets this look on his face of, of rapture. He lifts his hands up and he says, God, but when you put it all together, mix it all together and put the heat on it, he said, I sure do like me some good hot biscuits. Amen. God is wanting this morning to amalgamate all the ingredients of your life right now. He wants to mix them all together. And that's what Paul meant when he said all things work together for good for those that love God. And yes, the heat has to be applied to it. But the end result is biscuits. Amen. And that ought to be what you desire this morning in your life. Amen. God, tired of the flour, tired of the lard. But God, I'm going to put all this stuff in your hands. And God, you're getting ready to give me some biscuits. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.